Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. The pride and joy of the former Soviet Republic of Kyrgyzstan is a walnut forest. It's 74,000 acres, a pristine plot of land that produces wild apples, plums, pears, and cherries, and yes, walnuts. Locals boast that their wood was used to line Rolls Royces in England after its quality caught the attention of no less than Winston Churchill. That story may not be true, but this is. The walnut forest is threatened, and that's why the Missouri Botanical Garden has sprung into action. Earlier this week, members of its horticultural staff returned from a trip to Kyrgyzstan, where they're working with the locals and their most prized crop. Here to discuss the garden's Kyrgyzstan project is Meg Engelhart, manager of the Botanical Garden's Seed Bank. We're also joined by horticulturalist Dave Gunn. Meg Engelhart, Dave Gunn, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having Thanks us. For having us. So tell us this, why Kyrgyzstan? Of all the places in the world, how did Mobot end up deciding on this for this project? So Kyrgyzstan is located in Central Asia. Um, A lot of people have heard the name, but maybe don't really have an idea of where it's located. It's a mountainous region. And as you talked about, there are these ancient walnut fruit forests. Um, But the forests are drastically declining, especially in recent years. Um, So the Missouri Botanical Garden has been especially interested in species of this region because of that rapid decline and trying to figure out how we can get in there and help. Um, There's a botanical garden in Kyrgyzstan. It's the only botanical garden in the whole country. So we've teamed up with them. That's Gariv Botanical Garden to help develop their program there to support these forests and how we can meet them there and also collect materials from those forests to work on them here back in the United States. Now, you said these walnut forests are declining. What's causing that? So there are various reasons. Climate change, no doubt, is part of that. Um, Land use changes. A huge impact is that these trees are getting older and older, and we're not seeing regeneration because there are a lot of cattle that graze these areas. So um, you don't get regeneration of the the small plants growing back into trees. Also, it is um, fruit trees make nice firewood, so it's often chosen over some of the other trees that are harder to use as firewood. Um, so it's it's a it's a prized uh, material. So there's a lot of threats to these mm-hmm. forests here. Dave, I understand this was actually your third trip as part of this project. Yes, that's correct. So how does one even get to Kyrgyzstan? I'm assuming you can't just fly direct from St. Louis Airport. No, there are two ways. Um, generally, we leave out of Chicago or New York, the international terminals, and then the two options are to connect in Istanbul or Moscow, um, and then you fly direct, and then from there, direct land to Bishkek. Which so is only a couple of legs to get there. Yeah, not too terrible. Once you get to the airport, is it hard to get to the Walnut Forest? Uh, yes. Yeah, so usually once we would get on each of these trips, once we, um, once we arrive in Bishkek, we'll kind of take a a minute to kind of decompress and we'll meet with the team and we'll go to the botanical garden, come up with the plan and then uh, get the vehicles and any field materials that we need, uh, collection tools, things like that. And then um, for these regions to get into the initial region is about a 12 hour drive because we have to go over a big Tianshan mountain pass. And then once we get there, then we can stay at, um, what they call community-based tourism. So these are homeowners or property owners that have opened up their homes to visitors to stay. So Sort of the Airbnb of Kyrgyzstan. Correct, yeah, yeah, correct. And then we'll use these CBTs as like a base for maybe a week and then work that whole region. Um, okay, so it's a 12-hour yeah. drive, driving on highways, or are these back mountain paths, Meg? <laughs> I see you laughing. Yes, <laughs> so this trip to Kyrgyzstan was my first time um, going, and it's, it's, a, it's paved. Okay, so, so that's there's good. that. Um, but the rules are a little different than you know we expect on our interstates here, and so there's a lot of different kinds of vehicles with places to go. But there's basically one huge mountain pass that everyone's using, so it was pretty exciting. It's it's two lanes, sometimes a third okay. that can go in any either direction. Sometimes four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a little white knuckling going yes. on trying to yes. get there, but. We well, made it. So what was it like having these Airbnb-style hosts in this, it must be a fairly remote region um, where these forests are? Dave, were they used to having Americans traipsing through there? 
not as many Americans because American tourism in this region has yet to really take off, but they are trying to develop that. So a lot of the um, people that you'll see are from Europe. You'll see a lot of uh, Germans, French, Swiss, uh, especially climbers and hikers because of the, the mountainous region. Uh, a lot of Russian tourists and even uh, Kyrgyz tourists um, and people from uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, neighboring countries uh, will come. For us, having this research resource is huge because if you're doing field work, a lot of times you have to camp. And if you're doing a tent camp thing, then that adds a whole another layer of complication, you know, especially if it's cold or raining or hot or bugs or whatever. So being able to, and then you have to create an area where you're going to work if you're cleaning seeds or whatever. So having a roof over our heads and somebody to provide the meals was huge because we would, you know, work out in the field, then we'd come back, maybe clean up and then start the seed cleaning or you know, uh, scion wood preparation, whatever the project was. Um, and then, you know, we'd have meal and then maybe do data entry late into the evening, something like that, and then get up and do it all over. So, yeah, it was a, a very valuable resource. Nice to have these houses. Yeah, huge. Was there a language barrier with your hosts? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's very rare to find people that speak English. Um, a common language in that part of the world is Russian, but none of us on our team speak Russian. So we always had a translator from the Gariv Botanic Garden. So there were four of us on each of these trips, either three or four of us from Missouri Botanical Garden that would go, and then we'd team up with three or four people that were local to that region that could help us translate. So tell us what you were actually doing. You mentioned doing some seed cleaning. When you're out in this forest, what are you up to, um, you know, sort of on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, so the the best one of the best tools that botanical gardens can do to support uh, rare species conservation is called ex situ conservation or out of the field, where you're taking materials from its natural environment and bringing them back to a place where you can do research and find out more about those plants. So, and then support them going back into the wild. So we were especially collecting seeds. Um, and you mentioned that I'm the seed bank manager for Missouri Botanical Garden. Seed banking is a imp- very important resource because you can take a lot of genetic diversity from, say, a whole forest and collect various seeds and then store them in a relatively small amount of space for very long periods of time. Seeds and seed banks, if they're stored properly, can last for hundreds of years. So those resources can then be pulled out and tested and we can do um, germination trials. We can grow out plants and plant them back in the wild. Um, We can do genetic work to find out if there are um, problems within the population that's causing the decline and and them not being so successful and being able to produce fruit. Um, a lot of those questions. It's also important that those questions are able to be asked in the country of origin. So Missouri Botanical Garden makes sure that our resources are also being spent at the gardens in the country that we're working with. So we're able to help them build their own seed bank um, and develop their greenhouse and able to grow plants. So we collect seeds. Um, Dave mentioned we collect scion wood. Mm -hmm. I'll let him describe what that is. Yeah, so another strategy that uh, we can implement is some of the trees, as the population's in decline, some of the trees aren't producing fruit anymore. And we're still trying to answer those questions as to why they're not. So when we come across those populations, something we can do is uh, cut what's called scion wood, which is basically just a twig off the end of this year's growth that the trees put on. And then they can take that and graft it to a rootstock. And what that allows us to do is it's basically a genetic carbon copy of that original tree that we collected from. So um, orchard growers use this. So when you get an apple, you get a red delicious and a, um, the way they cop, you know, if you were to grow it from a seed, it wouldn't be a red delicious. It would be something else. The way that orchardists uh, accomplish that re- repetitive um, cloning, cloning, thank yeah. you, <laughs> <laughs> um, is through that grafting. Okay. And so we're able to do that as a conservation strategy also. Okay. We're talking with Dave Gunn and Meg Engelhart of the Missouri Botanical Garden about their trip to Kyrgyzstan. Help us understand why is it important to even save these seeds and try to preserve what's growing in these walnut forests? Obviously, we have apples here. We have plums here. All these fruits you're talking about don't seem that exotic. Dave, what's the point? Well, so from a species conservation perspective um, or habitat conservation, conservation perspective, an analogy that I like to use is the Jenga analogy. So you have a structure and you start removing pieces. Um, As you start removing pieces, things start to become less stable. You're not 
the riddle is what pieces can we remove and how many can we remove before things collapse? And the answers are, we don't know. We're mm -hmm. still learning this. So while we're learning this, um, because ecosystem dynamics are incredibly complex and beyond our understanding at this point, maybe it will always be beyond our understanding. Um, so basically we're coming in and collecting as much genetic material as we can so that at least the DNA is preserved before these things are lost. Okay, yeah. so yeah, that is some very important work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another aspect of that related to crops is that, um, you know, crop species are genetically similar. They're identical. They're clones. But if there's a problem like a, a blight or um, some kind of infection, some kind of pathogen, um, oftentimes we can rely back on their wild ancestors that has all that genetic diversity still within those species to maybe try to answer some of those questions or try to help save those species. So an, a red delicious apple that you buy at any grocery store tastes exactly the same. But these red apples, the... Um, the endangered Malus Needwitzkiana, which is what we were <laughs> That's collecting. That's quite a name there. <laughs> the Needs Whitsky apple. Um, any apple that you taste from one tree is going to taste completely different than another. And they they have such variation in their size and flavor and um, texture. And all of those variations could be really important if, that, if uh, a, a domestic apple is in trouble. Now, you mentioned that you were working there with the Kyrgyzstan's lone botanical garden. Yes. Uh, you must have compared at some point what it's it like working for the botanical garden in Missouri versus in Kyrgyzstan. What were some of the big differences that you saw, Dave? Well, something that we, I'll say some, something that we're able to appreciate or able to take advantage of is um, a generous public, you know. Mm -hmm. And so the Missouri Botanical Garden is largely donation driven, right? Um, and we get some pretty generous donations that allow us to put out some fantastic displays and be involved in some fantastic projects. Um, it's easy to take that for granted, um, and that's not how it works. You know, in other parts of the world, either the funds aren't available or the donors aren't around, or in some cases there's a faux pas um, between asking for funds or even giving the funds you know so some there's still some bridges that are being crossed and so organizations are, that are helping out with that are they there. relying on tax dollars or they're getting foreign aid for this um for independent projects like ours uh, there is some money that's coming in from private donors or uh, uh NGO donors, um, but they do receive some money from the government. Yeah, a small amount of money. We've just got time for one more question. This is the thing I'm always so interested in, but what was the food like in Kyrgyzstan? <laughs> <laughs> Meg? Yeah, it, it was, um, let's see, we had a lot of various meats were always involved. There's a lot of livestock around, so you got to see the cows and sheep and donkeys and horses were everywhere, so um, it, you always knew that your meat was local. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was rice dishes. There's um, a, a dumpling dish. I think every potatoes, carrots. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think every country has their dumpling style dish. Um, so yeah. a lot of good food. A lot of good yeah, food. Yeah, a lot of good food. We were well fed. <laughs> uh, Dave Gunn and Meg Engelhardt of the Missouri Botanical Garden. Thanks for joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, ninety point seven KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.